Okay, it's 4.30. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's event to discuss our latest report, which we're releasing today, which is focused on the role of cities in achieving net zero. Uh, the research on the event has been kindly supported by HSBC UK. Uh, we've got a great set of speakers to discuss the report's findings and policy recommendations, and I'll introduce them uh, in a moment. But as always, uh, a few words of housekeeping. Uh, the event is being recorded and will be made available on our website after the event. During the event, your microphones will be kept on mute. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is CFC Net Zero. There will be opportunity for questions to our speakers once they've had their say. And you can submit your questions at any time. You don't have to wait until they're all finished. And you do that by sending uh, your question via the chat function to ask a question. Uh, and if we, if time allows, we do like you to ask your question, so be prepared for that. But if you prefer me to read it out, that's also fine. Just let us know when you post it. And we will be finished by 5.30. So let me introduce our speakers. So our first speaker is going to be my colleague, Valentine Quinio. She's the report's uh, main author and Valentine will set out the report's main findings and recommendations. Following Valentine, we'll hear from Ian Stewart. Ian is the chief executive of HSBC UK. After Ian, we're gonna hear from two cities. First will be councillor Susan Brown, who is the leader of Oxford City Council and chair of the Fast Growth Cities Group. And then we'll hear from Neil Evans, who's the Director of Resources at Leeds City Council. So to kick us off, Valentin, over to you. Right, thanks Andrew, let me share my screen. Here we go. Um, right, so when we talk about the net zero challenge, uh, we mean the target which is now enshrined in law to meet net zero emissions by 2050, so in less than 30 years. And um, you may have heard um, last year that the UK um, was halfway there. Uh, and this is what is shown on the chart here, looking at emissions um, from 1990. Um, and it's important to mention here that these are emissions, uh, production-based emissions, so those occurring within um, the UK borders. And these have halved since uh, 1990. But the remaining part of the challenge is um, likely to be more difficult because it will involve cutting emissions in two sectors which have seen very little progress so far. Um, so most of the cuts we've seen were driven by a shift away from carbon intensive industry um, and energy sources like coal, for instance, but far less has been achieved um, in the transport and housing sector. And these two now account for two thirds of emissions. So it's a significant part of the remaining challenge. Um, and the dark uh, green line here shows that if nothing else is done, so without any additional policy intervention, the UK will not be on track to meet um, net zero. And so this was the starting point of the research, um, looking at the sort of invisible triangle here, trying to understand what needs to happen if the UK um, you know, meets uh, meet net zero. Um, and this will be a combination of sector and geography. And so this research looks at the role that different places will have to play uh, to achieve net zero, looking at the role that cities and large towns in particular will play. And cities are actually good for the environment. Um, so this might sound like a surprising statement because it's a common misconception that cities are not green. Uh, but when you look at emissions on a per capita basis, so looking at people's individual emissions, so people who live in cities have on average a lower carbon footprint than people who live in uh, rural areas. Um, so you see on the chart here, it's about four tons um, a year for people who live in cities against more than six in the rest of the country. So first, why is that the case? Um, well, this is because of the very nature of cities. So the fact that industrial activities tend to locate outside cities is a core part of the explanation. Um, but when you look at transport and housing, and that's in uh, purple and light green on the chart, you see that emissions per head are lower in cities too. And this has to do with the benefits of density um, and the fact that you know, density, which is inherently unique to cities, um, encourages lifestyles which are um, less carbon intensive. So starting with transport, um, you see that you know, by definition in dense urban environments, um, journeys are shorter, and that means that they require less energy. 
Um, so whether that's going to work, picking up kids from school, going shopping, uh, less energy uh, means less carbon emissions. Um, and so shorter journeys are, you know, have a lower carbon footprint, either because they can be walked or cycled, or because they're more likely to be made on public transport. Um, and part of that is because it will be much more viable for a public transport, transport operator to run a route in a dense urban area where there's enough demand for it. So that explains why transport emissions are lower in cities. Um, and on the housing front, cities tend to have um, a high proportion of flats. Um, so flats are smaller, so they emit less, but they are also, they tend to be more energy efficient um, than typical out of town, single family detached housing. So on these two counts, transport and housing, cities will have a key role to play in helping the UK hit its net zero target as places where greater progress can be achieved or can be met um, in cutting emissions. But for many places, this will mean tapping into the benefits of density. Um, and the problem is that many UK cities um, are not very dense compared to their international counterparts. Um, and here I'm not comparing London to Hong Kong, for instance, which is a very extreme model of density with very high tower blocks. But loads of European cities do achieve what we can call gentle density levels uh, that UK cities um, generally do not do not uh, meet. So these are places like Barcelona, Paris, uh, Naples, um, quite a lot denser than cities like uh, Manchester or Bristol, for instance. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, but the main one is because very often new residential developments um, tend to be pushed on the outskirts of cities um, rather than on brownfield land in existing built up areas. So they tend to be quite low density, quite isolated, from existing public transport network and therefore more difficult to serve with public transport. And this is illustrated um, on the satellite pictures here, uh, which look, the picture on the left um, is a classic example of a low density um, residential development, which is part of Sunderland's um, city boundaries. And on the right, it's a much denser neighborhood um, in West London. And the pictures at the bottom um, show public transport stops and the darker the blue shows um, reliability of public transport. And so you see that in London, it's not just that there's more public transport options, but also that they're much more reliable. And so that confirms that low density tends to um, lock people and neighborhoods into car dependency um, to move around. And that has a knock-on impact on transport emissions. And so in London, the fact that there's quite a high um, availability of public transport options um, tends to explain why Londoners um, have the low, one of the lowest um, transport emission, well, transport footprints um, in the country. And this has had an impact, so all these trends in terms of residential development also have, an, have had an impact on domestic emissions. So the table here confirms that um, flats tend to emit much less carbon than houses. Um, and by flats, we don't necessarily mean, you know, high tower blocks, but mid-rise buildings or even terrace housing um, do you know, tend to have a much lower carbon footprint than typical out-of-town single-family detached um, housing. Um, but as you can see on the table here, in recent years, uh, a very high proportion of new build completions uh, were houses. It was nearly 80% in 2019. So the recent trends we've seen in terms of de development have gone against um, the net zero agenda. So, if the UK wants to achieve um, net zero, this will have to change. And it needs to start by changing the way cities are spatially planned. Um, so we need to build the right types of homes in the right location near existing public transport network. And that will be key to cut both transport and housing emissions. And this change will make interventions or specific interventions and policies on transport much more impactful. Um, and they will support a shift away from car dependency so there's a need to move away uh, from car dependency and to incentivize the take up of low carbon alternatives. Um, most of that will have to be public transport. And then a remaining part of that uh, will have to be uh, a shift to clean vehicles like electric cars. And then on housing, there's two priorities. The first one is to prioritize the development of compact, more energy efficient housing stock. And then the second one will be um, tackling the emissions of the existing housing stock, which is one of the um, least energy efficient um, in Europe. Um, and the reason, the reason why we need to address it is because most of the buildings that will be there in 2050 have already been built 
um, and so we need to address their emissions now. And if we do this, the size of the price is um, quite substantial. So I'll just say a quick word on that, but there's much more in the report. Uh, but we, we ran some calculations looking at the impact of a few policy measures on carbon emissions. And these calculations suggest that by 2035, if we see um, a significant modal shift and an uptake of low carbon transport, then we can reach up to 87% reductions in transport emissions. And on the housing front, um, data suggests that we could reach up to 40% uh, of carbon reduction in carbon emissions if we proceed to a significant retrofit of the housing stock. So what needs to be done? The first thing that needs to be done is to integrate transport and housing policy. So at the moment, only the Mayor of London um, has powers to coordinate within a single strategy and a single document, transport planning and spatial planning. And so that allows him, for instance, to build transport where homes are and the other way around. Uh, but elsewhere in the country, um, these powers are often fragmented, either between Whitehall and local government or between different levels of local government themselves. Um, and so this needs to change. Now, within this point on planning, there's another important intervention um, that relates to the planning system and the government needs to deliver on changes to the planning system. And that's because the current system um, tends to facilitate development on the outskirts of cities by making it riskier for developers to proceed to infill sort of densification within existing built up areas. Um, and so this could change with uh, a zoning system where it would be up for local authorities to identify areas for growth and for medium density levels in line with um, sort of carbon footprint objectives and carbon targets. Um, then we'll need a series of government interventions. Um, one of them will have to be delivering on a pledge to phase out petrol and diesel cars by 2030. Um, the other one will be uh, on housing. We need some subsidies and policy sticks to incentivize homeowners to retrofit their homes. So we need to reconsider schemes like the Green Homes Grant, uh, which has been scrapped just a few months after it was introduced. And then the last element will be uh, local policy interventions and for local leaders to use the powers they already have at hand. So on transport, clean air zones are a good example of that. We know that clean air zones which charge drivers in the central areas of the city are quite effective at tackling uh, and reducing emissions. So they have been in place in London for a few years now and Birmingham has just introduced theirs. Um, and so other cities need to follow suit. Um, other measures on transport may include investing in public transport, um, which may involve making permanent some of the changes or the measures that have been implemented as a response to the pandemic. So I'll stop now. There's much more in the report that was just a brief overview and I'll be happy to take questions uh, later on. Back to you, Andrew. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Valentine for that very uh, great overview uh, but as Valentine said uh, an awful lot more detail in examples and illustrations and uh, data in the report so I encourage you after the event obviously to um, to have a look at that uh, but if you've got any questions based on what Valentine has said then uh, pop them in the chat function and when we when we get the questions we'll um, we'll take them so uh, we've heard about the report and the policy recommendations and the findings and let's hear from our panelists and Ian let's go to you first and get your reflections yeah well thank you very much and um, you hear from me today from Birmingham so a, a really good afternoon to everyone and thank you to Centre for Cities for producing such an important report and thank you Valentine for your opening comments now we know when we work with centres for cities that they don't pull any punches and this report is no different. And what's clear from the recent work, whether on net zero or levelling up, is that the public sector cannot meet these challenges alone. Private finance will need to meet the greatest share of these costs. So HSBC is up for playing its part in that challenge at both a global um, and a local level. And first, we are uh, financing the transition. We are aiming to commit up to $1 trillion in sustainable financing and investment to support our clients uh, and reducing our lending portfolio to net zero by 2050 or sooner. And that's our global commitment across all our customer base. So 30 years to sort that out. Secondly, 
We aim to achieve net zero in our own operations and supply chain by 2030 or sooner. And thirdly, and this is this is arguably one of the most important points, is that we are retooling our customer offer to focus on sustainability uh, from green finance solutions to dedicated advice. I would like to focus on three areas in the report where we see the most opportunities. So first of all, on greening the transport system, and Valentin's already touched on some of those points. Second, on greening the housing stock, and I think there's some data in there that may surprise you. And finally, on the role of SMEs in driving the transition. So let's talk about part one first, the greening of the transport system. As the report says, transport accounts for one third of all carbon emissions, and most of these emissions come from private cars. Clear that two things need to happen. We must shift our reliance from private cars towards public and active transport, such as cycling, and we must make sure the cars that we do own are clean. Industry can and will play a big role in both areas. So as an example, um, HSBC UK funded uh, the rollout of 25 new electric buses in London. This expanded bus fleet will save more than 5,500 tonnes of carbon dioxide in the capital in the lifetime of those buses. But to meet the scale of the challenge, we need to make it easier for consumers to move away from petrol and diesel cars. That means, for example, installing enough electric vehicle charging points and putting the infrastructure in place to increase the use of public transport and cycling. Now, part two is greening the housing stock. And it's shocking but not surprising that 31% of all emissions come from houses. And I think many people will be quite surprised by that statistic. So to tackle the problem, we need to develop new low carbon housing but also improve the quality of existing housing we have in the UK today. And that is not just about the environment, but also about fairness. We know that energy inefficient housing costs the most to live in, and that over 3 million households live in fuel poverty in the UK. Again, there are good examples of public-private partnerships to meet these challenges. In HSBC, we recently provided a green development loan to a housing association to build more than 600 sustainable new homes in Greenwich, with 50% of those affordable housing. But again, we need to be realistic about the scale of the challenge. More than a third of the UK houses were built before the Second World War, and we will not meet our emissions targets without retrofitting large sections of our existing housing stock. Banks are rapidly developing green loans and mortgage products, but high costs and long payback times for equipment replacement, such as heat pumps, are deterring homeowners from making investments. If we are going to increase the scale of retrofitting, we need to work together to create the incentives for people to make the change. The third point is the role of small and medium enterprises in the UK. SMEs are the lifeblood of our economy, and we mustn't forget their role in decarbonising our cities. Now remember, there are 6 million businesses in the UK today, but 5.7 million of those are SMEs. And most small companies, they lack the expertise, the advice and the resources to manage their own green transition. We must make life easier for SMEs. That starts with education and we all have a role to play here. We are building a centre of ESG excellence with 500 sustainable finance ambassadors to help small businesses manage their transition. And we must develop policy with small businesses in mind. Let's create the incentives for SMEs to invest in greening their operations. And let's also make sure any new reporting regimes 
do not make it too costly or burdensome for SMEs to prove their sustainability credentials and lose business as a result. So in conclusion, while we know the challenge is vast, we must focus now on solutions. Public and private partnership is key to achieving our net zero targets, as is creating the right policy landscape. That includes putting in place the infrastructure for sustainable transport, putting in place the right incentives for greening our housing stock and empowering our SMEs to lead the transition. We all have a role to play across the public and private sectors, and I look forward to HSBC playing its part in the transition. Thank you very much, and I'll hand you back. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ian, reminding us that, you know, we often talk about policy from the government sphere, but actually we need to engage uh, with the with the private uh, community more broadly to uh, to really address these problems. We had several questions already about whether you, particularly to you, about whether you feel a balance between in a government activity and uh, and the the individual activity is, is the, of the right sort. So when we get the questions, maybe I'll get you to reflect on on that. But let's hear from our cities now. And first off, we're going to go to Oxford and hear from Susan. There we are. Hi, Susan. You need to unmute. And away you go. Good to see you. And over to you. Hi. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, sorry to be slightly late. I uh, hope I wasn't causing anyone a panic attack. Um, so I just thought I'd give a little bit of an overview about what it is that we're doing to achieve net zero um, and then a little on what we might be asking from central government. Um, so as we've heard, cities are an essential part of the transition to net zero. We produce high carbon emissions, but we're also good, good, uh, good providers of the solutions as well, uh, as mass transit and smart energy grids are far more effective and scalable in dense urban populations. Um, so a little bit about what we've done in Oxford. Um, I think it's important to say that uh, when we set up our citizens assembly uh, in 2019 on um, climate emergency, we weren't then starting from scratch. We actually started in 2011 by setting up Low Carbon Oxford, a network of organisations um, working together across our city with an aim to reduce carbon emissions in Oxford by 40% by 2020, which we achieved. And that in turn built on decades of work to encourage active travel, although we didn't always call it that then, as well as other environmental measures and campaigns. So the Citizens' Assembly obviously followed on from our own climate emergency declaration, um, and there was a recognised need that we needed to step up our ambition at that point. I think the Assembly is a really important aspect of uh, of, of, of the work in this area because it was all about engagement with a, a group of citizens. They were a small group of citizens, uh, a representative sample of 50 Oxford residents, but I think it was really interesting for me personally to watch them on that journey, learning about the effects of climate change and what we might be able to do and what we needed to do in order to tackle it. Um, and I think the difficulty for all of us is that we need to be taking everybody on that journey uh, and it did require a lot of engagement in order to get some people through through that process. Um, so the participants in our assembly considered measures to reduce Oxford's carbon emissions to net zero uh, and as part of this measures to reduce Oxford City Council's own carbon footprint to net zero by 2030. Uh, and by the way picking up really on our proof from our previous speaker by one of the findings of the assembly that members found most surprising was that the largest proportion of emissions came from buildings they typically assumed that transport or industry would create the greatest emissions and and largely um, of course it's existing buildings that are our biggest emitters and that therefore require difficult retrofitting um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Oxford but we do have a few iconic buildings which could be quite tricky uh, to do some fitting on. Partly as a, a result of the Citizens Assembly, uh, we have also appointed our own scientific advisor, uh, University of Oxford's Professor Nick Eyre, who's a senior research fellow in energy at the university. Um, and he's been a, a great source of useful information for us uh, and good advice. 
detailed and scientifically robust analysis shows that in Oxford we can achieve net zero by 2040. It's a challenging yet achievable goal. The City Council's estate and operations only account for about 1% of the city's carbon emissions. We're leading the way by committing to reduce those emissions to net zero by 2030. And we're doing that in a number of different ways. For instance, one example, we're taking part in the government's decarbonisation programme and are aiming to decarbonise our leisure centres this year. And this work is very challenging, particularly in the very tight timescales we have been given to work in. But we also take our role as a convener uh, as a re really seriously, and we have estimated that we have the power to influence a further 66% of Oxford's total carbon footprint. So this, uh, this year we convened the Zero Carbon Oxford Summit, um, which I chair, and 21 of the city's most prominent leaders from both of our universities, our hospitals, other local authorities and large businesses, including BMW and the city's largest shopping centre, all came together to commit to support Oxford's journey to net zero by 2040. And this formation of our Zero Carbon Oxford partnership represents a real shift in approach. We're not just focusing on organisational emissions, we're committing to collaborate together, to learn from each other, to allow us to achieve more together than we could individually. So our next stage in that particular partnership is the Zero Carbon Oxford Roadmap and Action Plan, and both of those are due to be published later this month. And again, that's about leveraging that power and influence of the city's institutions to make ambitious interventions with both environmental and social benefits. The action cuts across multiple different sectors, focuses on projects that require cooperation and coordination between partners, uh, and, and I think will unlock interventions that would be impossible if we were all working individually. To stay on track for net zero, some of the most important actions will need to come in the next five to 10 years, including a programme to scale up domestic retrofit across social and private housing. And we're obviously starting the work on that in our, in our own council housing, which we still retain stock in Oxford. We're also looking at greening that last mile delivery through trialling micro consolidation centres and quiet delivery a mini hydrogen network feasibility study and establishing campus scale integrated energy systems. So what do we want from government? Well, we know that the scale of action required to achieve net zero will need government support to, to, to help us deliver it. So what, what do we want from them? Um, the Centre for Cities Net Zero report outlines some key measures that could prove essential to, to the net zero transition for the UK as a whole, as does our own roadmap and action plan. So from our perspective in Oxford, what we would welcome is a change to building standards and planning guidance to phase out new builds with anything less than passive house standards. We'd like to see a reintroduction of incentives for installation of solar panels and renewables and a simplification of regulations and reduction in costs to enable smart local energy systems. We'd like to see a really significant training and investment programme to build capacity and confidence in the retrofit installation market. We know there's a massive skill shortage here and this feels like a really good time to be introducing that sort of programme. We know that government will need to provide hundreds of billions of pounds of capital funding that will be required to retrofit all existing UK buildings. So we need to be thinking about how we're going to do that, perhaps through an establishment of a UK local green investment bank. We need to implement a coherent strategy for electric vehicle charging and active travel infrastructure to ensure fair and affordable access for all citizens and to make a modal shift much easier. We need to set dates for the full decarbonisation of the electricity network. We need to invest at scale in hydrogen technology development for heavy transport needs. And finally, last but not least, we also need to provide incentives for people to ditch polluting private vehicles and switch to electric. So those are my asks, Andrew, and uh, I'm happy to hand back to you at that point. Very good. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Susan. Yes, I smiled when you reference the fact that Oxford, plus amongst other places, has a very great number of iconic old buildings where retrofitting those may well be a challenge, right? Okay. Maybe something we'll get onto. Let's hear from, uh, from Leeds and Neil. Neil, over to you. 
Hi there, and um, thank you for the report. And there's a lot which resonates in there for uh, for Leeds. Uh, there's also actually, despite the differences between Leeds and Oxford, quite a lot of which resonates in what uh, Councillor Brown was saying about what they're doing in in Oxford. I'll try not to repeat um, various things which 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 are quite similar. Uh, one interesting thing which which we did in terms of basing our strategy um, in some science was to actually work with our university in forming a commission a few years ago, which kind of uh, mirrors the UK the UK setup. And that commission includes the big energy users within the city as well to come up with a joint plan. Um, uh, to, which we could all focus on and which, which, which was based on some scientific targets. And that's helped us kind of develop a roadmap into the future. Um, and, that's, and that's, I think, well worth looking at. Uh, uh, there's a can-do cities uh, um, website, which is, which is worth people having a, having a glance at. In terms of then the things which we are doing, I think it is important that organisations uh, set an example. So just looking internally at ourselves and taking a cancer price point about only taking up 1% of the, the usage, nevertheless, it, it is important to um, show an example. We've pretty much now moved all our small fleet over to electric vehicles. We've now got something like 330 electric vehicles, all emblazoned going around the, the city showing that. Uh, we've made a very, very significant reduction in our building stock in terms of what we occupy as a council with major retrofit of, uh, of most of those buildings take, uh, having taken place over the last couple of years and in progress at the moment, including our, 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 our sports centres. Um, we've moved, we're moving over our street lighting over to LED. And then in terms of our council housing, we still have around about 55,000 homes much of our, uh, a huge proportion of our investment through the housing revenue account is now being switched over to the zero carbon uh, challenge. And in particular at the moment, we've got a process of um, retrofitting our multi-stories. We've got something like 116 multi-story blocks uh, and we are working our way through those blocks with a combination of district heating, which I'll say a little bit about in, in a moment, and um, ground source heat pumps, which are replacing the old storage heaters, which, uh, which, which people had to suffer with, which actually give a massive reduction in carbon as well as halving people's bills. So those are things which we're doing, if you like, under our, our own steam around our organisation some, for some of our tenants. But I think there are then the broader issues of the impact we can make within the city as a whole. One of those things, which, uh, which I think probably is our, our flagship, is the development of a district heating system based around our energy from waste plant. Uh, we moved away entirely from landfill to, to, an energy, uh, to an energy from waste plant a few years back. And that is now the source of, a, of energy for a district heating system. Uh, we used uh, uh, up the anchor of 2000 flats within, within the city centre, which we, we have as a council uh, as a basis for that. But we've also then joined it up with our, our, our major civic buildings, but also connecting to the building of the DWP, the theatres, the, uh, the hospital and the university have also recently joined up. And it's a basic and we can actually expand that network to connect to our, our housing development plans within the city centre, which I'll say a little bit about further in a, in a, in a, in a, in a moment. Um, Beyond that, um, we, we've, we've, we've also got the, the, the broader retrofit of, of, of housing uh, to address within the private sector. We've done some demonstrator projects around some of the poorest back-to-back -back housing in, in the city, which um, has seen in, in shifts from um, F and G ratings to B and C ratings, people living in great poverty, ambient temperatures 12, 13 degrees actually being improved to 18 degrees, which can show that it can be done. But that, that, that remains our, 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 our probably our biggest, biggest challenge, I think, in terms of uh, what we can do around uh, private housing. I'll say something a little bit about that uh, at, at the back end of this. On the transport front, um, we've, we're doing something like a £270 million uh, investment programme over the last uh, couple of years and ongoing, which is targeted at um, reduction in, in the dependence upon the car, 
uh, with a, a, a ring of park and ride schemes, uh, public transport interventions aimed to double patronage uh, in buses very, over, over a very quick period and focusing much more on active transport through uh, walking, uh, walking and cycling and the development of, a, of the electric infrastructure for the future. And we, we di didn't, in the end, actually introduce a clean air zone charging zone, but we had one on the stocks to actually achieve um, the compliance with the nitrogen dioxide uh, limits. And through that actually shifted uh, through incentives and the threat of that coming in, 50% uh, now of our private hire and taxi is, is, is hybrid. The bus companies agree to actually upgrading their, their vehicles also to, to Euro 6. And we've got now 90% plus compliance in HGV as well. So that, those things have, have made a significant difference. In terms of the housing strategy, and this, 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 this actually does connect very much to the report, um, the bulk of, of the, the biggest developments will be in the city centre. So we have something like 20,000 units uh, planned for the city centre over the next uh, 12, 12 years, um, which will see a significant densification of, 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 of the city centre. And, there are, and, and the vast majority of the 50,000 homes which we're looking at um, are on, on, on brownfield developments. Um, what I think is important actually then in looking at um, that, 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 that particularly that city centre development is what we all will also do to actually make it an attractive environment. Because I, as I sit in a large Edwardian house looking out in the garden, it's all very well to preach to people about living in dense urban environments, but they've got to be attractive urban environments. And we do need to take on the challenge of how do we de deliver things like biodiversity within dense city centres too, um, in order to actually address that issue, but as well as make it a really attractive proposition for, for, for individuals going forward. Just coming on then to the quickly to, to the issue of, of government ass, I think private retrofit is a massive issue. Yeah. And um, clearly there's an enormous amount of money which needs to be spent in that area and incentives for, for, for people to take, take it up, um, subsidies for people who can't afford it. But I think I, I'd also completely reinforce Councillor Brown's point about skills, uh, which I think, uh, frankly, I think one of the reasons the government intervention recently failed is actually lack of actual supply within yeah. the system itself. And actually, if, if you threw a load of money at the system, at the issue at the moment, there wouldn't be the people to do the work. And I think it is going to take quite a skills revolution over the next decade to actually create that workforce, which can actually do that work. It's, it's a massive challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity for us in terms of, yeah. in terms of the economy. Um, and then on the public transport front, despite the amount of money going in, Nevertheless, uh, there remain very significant issues for us to deal with as a big city in terms of we don't have a mass transit system, much of the rail system, which, which then also supports uh, the city with lot, very large movements of people um, across the north in and around Leeds and Manchester does need still absolutely substantial in investment. And with it, as you were also indicating in the report, greater degrees of devolution, uh, which enable you to actually uh, plan those things in an inter integrated in an in integrated way. Yeah. I won't actually repeat similar, similar, very similar asks. We would also have a government, other than to say, actually might make a more general point that that what we don't have at the moment is a planning and highway uh, system. Uh, I'm, I'm basing on things like um, bids for for funding, which fully integrates with the government's own targets to become carbon neutral and there does need to be a complete review of the planning and the, and the funding system which recognizes that 2050 target whereas at the moment these things actually run off in contradiction to one another. The last thing I'd say is actually there is a, also a bit of an ask for government in terms of general public engagement and we've, we've done a lot of public engagement we've also had a citizens jury and so forth but in a democratic society we need to actually bring people with us. We can do some of that locally, but actually that big national push on winning hearts and minds, the sorts of changes which we need to make over the, over the coming decades, I think is, is of critical importance.
Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Uh, loads in uh, in the four presentations. We've got about um, 15 minutes, so we're not going to do justice to all of them. But I wanted to start with you, Ian. Um, all of all of our speakers talked about it in different ways about you know the need for incentives, the need for funding from government. You talked about you know private finance being critical. We've had several questions about you know have we got the balance right in terms of you know what we expect from the individual, say in a retrofit context, and the funding and and regulation that is coming from or government, or is that still too skewed one way or another? Ian, what's your reflection on, on the, how do you see that evolving over time? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was quite fascinating, both Neil and Susan mentioning some of the numbers, and they, they are quite eye-watering, the amount of investment required. Retrofitting, um, and it's interesting because we don't have the skills today, but I, I was finding this out quite recently. If you want to put a heat pump in a house, my understanding is it's £17,000 for a heat pump. So if you're living in South Kensington and putting £17,000 investment into your house, it maybe feels okay. If you're in the Highlands of Scotland and putting £17,000 into your house, it's a massive investment. Point one. Second point, there is not a manufacturer, I don't think, of said heat pumps in the UK today. And then you get into the whole point of insulation. Um, but, but Neil's point is right, it's, it's, it's you need the skills. Um, we, we need people to do this work and they are not available in the UK today. So when I start to think about this, I'm thinking about how many SMEs or businesses are out there who should be gearing up for all this work before you get to the funding. Now, now let's get to the funding. There is no doubt that the financial system in the UK will have to lean into this because people don't have just thousands and thousands of pounds to do this. But will it be incentives or will it be debt? And that's not clear at the moment. And when solar panels were coming in, then there were some government incentives, but they, they phase out quite quickly. And, and so there is this debate, I think it's a gray area right now, but I think at the end of the day, it will be individuals who are gonna to have to foot the bill for, for the bulk of this and whether that's long-term funding on your mortgages or loans to make sure your houses come up to standard, um, I'm not quite sure yet. But um, I, I, if I, I was guessing, I, I think it will be on us to get this sorted out. So um, we, we think we've got a, 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 real, a really long runway on funding to come over the next 15 to 20 years. And I say 15 to 20 because the work has to get done. Uh, so that people start to get the benefit and we start to save this uh, the, the environment. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'll draw others in as well. But uh, we had a, we've had a question from Rachel who's asked me to put it, and I'm going to put it to Susan and, and Neil. So her question is, are we being radical enough? Should we be banning cars from our cities rather than talking about charging them? Susan, are we being radical enough? Is Oxford being <laughs> radical enough? Spin the car off. Lots of people than worry think about we're too radical already, is <laughs> all I can say. Um, uh, lots of people also think we're not radical enough. So I, I think part of the problem is these are really divisive issues. Um, and uh, I think one of the things I would say is that I, I don't think just converting all the cars we have currently to electric cars is not the solution. Um, we do need people to, to move around differently. We need people to get more involved in active travel uh, and to switch to public transport, which can then be better. Um, it can be more efficient uh, and more um, responsive and um, uh, and cheaper. So the, it, it's trying to get that done in the right order is, is always the trick and, and, and important. Um, but I don't think we will see total end of use of cars, maybe a bit more of an end to private cars. I mean, I think car clubs uh, really are part of the future solutions, um, but um, there will always be people for whom, for specific reasons, there is a need to have a, a, have a, a private car to travel around in, whether that's for reasons of disability or for work or, or for whatever. Um, but we should be trying our hardest to reduce the number of those journeys as far as possible. Uh, and that is what we are trying to do in Oxford. Um, but 
uh, there's there's a lot of work to do I think in taking people with us and and I think that was the biggest area of resistance that we found in our citizens assembly uh there was a, there was much more general agreement on every other issue for that there was a core group of about 25 percent of the citizens assembly who were like I want to keep my car and you know almost you know nothing could persuade them that um uh, having their own personal car wasn't something that they would want to always have uh, for the future. Yeah, no, that's a good, very, very good point. Uh, Neil, I mean, your reflection on this and then, you know, that point that Susan uh, finished on, which is the need to bring people with you in a sense, otherwise, and we've seen this in regards to, you know, the low, uh, the low traffic neighbourhoods where it's just, you know, there's been carnage in different parts of the, the country and resistance um, to them. But just a general point, yeah. are we being bold enough well, I, 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 my experience is very similar to Captain Brown's, I think, in terms of the, the post bag. It can be, you know, it will be people who are active in the in the uh, climate change agenda clearly feel extremely passionate, and we will receive a lot of, that, of, of uh, post, post in that way. But but actually, whenever there's a hold up of 10 minutes because we're doing an improvement to public transport, we'll also get deluged by complaints there. And... and, and so, so there it is a very divisive issue. Um, I, I suppose I'd make a couple, few points. Actually, one is actually one one of the solutions is what the report's about, which is having city centre densification for some for more people, which actually does enable people to realistically um, get around. And and I, I think the point which was was which Valentin was making, which was uh, it also makes public transport more viable. Um, because you've got that, because you've got that density. Clearly, there are things about improving uh, uh, infrastructure as well uh, as an alternative. But I think to be being realistic about it, that the nature of, of British settlement patterns means that public transport isn't likely to work in certain scenarios, and somewhere like Leeds. Has, uh, has is very broadly spread actually we're, we're unusual as a city you know we stretch out from the city centre 15 miles to Weatherby um, you know another 10, 10 miles out to Watley and, and lots of scattered developments public transport isn't going to pay its way in those in those sort of places and the way that we've developed over you know decades and decades means that there will I think continue to be some reliance upon upon the private car Park and ride and things like that can help, but we'll also be dependent, I think, to some extent on the electric car as well. Yeah, and that's a great point. It's one of the reasons in the paper we were quite keen to focus on how do you create the conditions where public transport becomes more viable. Hmm. One of the ways you do that is obviously to increase the potential pool of users, and that's a, an issue about density, rather than often we think of the other way around, is that we ignore the pool of users and just worry about how do we make public transport viable if the pool of users is not sufficiently uh, large? It's a very good point. Valentin, a, a big question for you. Uh, maybe I'll get um, uh, other colleagues to come in on this as well. So this is from Julie, again, asking uh, me to ask it. She says, how much have our, has the way our lives changed during the pandemic, working from home, for example? Will that make reaching net zero harder or uh, easier? So it's a big question there. You've done previous work on uh, what happened during the pandemic in relation to things like car use and what that meant for air quality. But just your thoughts on that, Valentin. Yeah, that's a really big question and really timely. So yes, we did some work on air pollution, looking at uh, the so traffic levels um, increase and decrease as a result of the lockdowns. And what we saw is that there was a short term improvement back in April 2020 because of the lockdown. But then uh, back in September 2020, traffic levels went up to where they were pre pandemic. And that's because people were shifting away from uh, private transport to private cars. Now, in terms of the for the work from home question, that's a really timely question because we now need to sort of assess whether whether or not the changes we've seen in behaviors in the past few months are carbon friendly or not. And on this question of work from home, it's often assumed that um, while well, staying at home will reduce uh, carbon footprint. And that is true to a small extent, if you consider, you know, for people who drive to work, then not going to the office will mechanically uh, reduce emissions from these journeys. Um, but it's important to nuance this argument because commuting journeys only account for 14% of all car trips and only, I think, 24% of distance traveled. 
So they're not the largest contributor to uh, car emissions. And this is where density matters. You know, density matters not just for uh, commutes, but also for journeys you do, you know, to go shopping or to go, um, you know, picking up kids from school, for instance. And so in a, in a context that was really interesting in a context, um, you know, post-COVID situation, if you imagine scenario and touch on that in the report, where a household moves further away from the city centre because they feel they, didn't, they do not need to commute to the, city, to the office every day, then provided that they did, you, did not use public transport uh, before, then yes, they might save carbon on these journeys. But we need to nuance this argument by saying that they might end up using the car more for other purposes if they move further away to a dense area. Um, and on top of that, we need to add two things. The first will be um, moving to a larger home, which has uh, potential impacts on energy, energy usage, and also staying at home all day, which we know might you know, offset potential savings in, in carbon transport carbon emissions. We've, we've all seen our energy bills um, go up last year. So to put it, to put it quite simply, uh, it's not, it's not a very easy answer. And, and we need to uh, maybe, you know, offset um, both um, sort of metrics. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Working from home does not necessarily equate to reduced carbon uh, emissions in the aggregate or indeed at the individual level. And I've seen lots of commentary that just makes that assumption. And I think it's, uh, it's the wrong assumption to make without further work on on that. But but Neil, very very briefly, I mean, has the pandemic and what you've seen happen has it changed your views in terms of what needs to happen in Leeds, you know, to get towards net zero, or is it is it a bump in the road? But you kind of carry on. I think it is really difficult to predict. Actually, um, I, 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 what I would say, however, is uh, I mean, I, I think there probably will be long lasting impacts in terms of the people's. Patterns of patterns of work. Um, these city centres are very much based around office um, accommodation, and we've already seen, and, and we ourselves are seeing that lots of people are going to change their work patterns. Potentially, actually, that can sometimes can can mean we can have more accommodation in the city centre. Uh, but I think what it what it, it raises is the challenge of why would people want to live there. And if and it actually maybe that people aren't necessarily always going to live in the city centre because of work, but you actually live in a city centre because actually it's a really interesting place to live and a thriving place to live, and that's where you can actually there are so many more cultural activities and and it's a, and 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 it's got to be and it can be affordable in in other ways and, and so forth. So so actually I think addressing why people want to live there. And actually, making it an attractive proposition is our is our key challenge. Now, it might be a slightly different one from it was two years ago, when there was this maybe uh, automatic feeling that people would live there because they could walk to work. Yeah, it's a very good point. I'll let Ian and, and, and Susan come in on on, on the issue, the questions we've asked already. But I'm just conscious that I'm so trying to whiz through them. Uh, Ian, uh, Ian, we've had a question about so th this is from Guy. He says thinking about bringing together public and private. How could a big financier like HSBC do more to help local authorities get moving on this? Is, this, is there some kind of future revenue gain that could, they could borrow against? You know, you talked about bonds. I mean, how do you see that evolving over time? Is it, is it bringing together several local authorities together to bring scale and momentum to the, you know, to the market? Is that a potential area? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a really good challenge. Um, the one thing, it's funny, we had a conversation this morning about w w will we mo move to a more sort of joint venture type arrangement? So talk, take housing stock. I was, I was really taken by Neil and Susan's comments about just the amount of council homes we still got, which I'm a big fan of. So I, I was really pleased to hear that. Um, uh, and so the next, the next answer, how, we've never got enough housing stock in the UK. I think we've got 31 million homes in the UK. We need a lot more. There isn't, there isn't the land to build on. We've got flood zones. We've got all sorts of things that impact that. So, you know, is, is it going to be more joint ventures going forward? I can definitely see that. I mean, so we've got liquidity. We've got capital. The, the councils have got the land. They've got the planning. They've got the expertise. And they've got the people. So I could, I could definitely see that. And one of the things we discussed quite recently is if you go back to 
P PFI has got a really bad reputation from what happened in probably the 70s through the 80s. So I'm not, I'm not here to advocate that. But it needs to be something on that sort of line that, you know, there has to be a return for the investors, all these things, but it has to be sensible and pragmatic. Um, and it probably has to be very long term. So, you know, green bonds will get much more popular and, you know, funding over 30, 40, 50 years, I don't think will be abnormal going forward. But I could definitely see much more joint venture type arrangements. Um, so you're, you're sharing the risk and the reward over a long period of time. Great point. Susan, your thoughts in this sort of space about how we, you know, how public and private come together, not just from, you know, from an expertise point of view, but also, you know, how we then think about how we finance some of the, the changes that we're going to need, because the sum is going to be very, very large and no one pot is going to be able to, to remotely get anywhere near covering the, you know, the cost of that, even if we get payback down the line. But, but your thoughts on that, Susan? Well, it is indeed the 50 gazillion dollar question, isn't it? Um, uh, and I, I think it, it is interesting that um, going back to the point I made that the biggest single issue actually in terms of Oxford, in terms of um, emissions is our existing buildings. Uh, and, and even when people had got their heads around that, they still mainly felt it was someone else's problem. Um, so they, they were basically kind of going, yeah, but that's probably the council to sort out and maybe the universities because they own quite a lot of buildings. But actually what we're saying to people is, well, that's true. We have responsibilities as landowners and in the case of the city council as, a, as an owner of homes. But actually, it's also about your home uh, and, and your responsibility. And of course, people don't uh, <laughs> want to dip into their pockets um, to, 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 to make that investment, which could be quite substantial. Um, and they don't necessarily see the returns. So I think that is one of the really big challenges we have to get right, is, is trying to find the way of uh, providing the capital, making it, giving people the right incentives to make sure that they are taking those steps. Um, because we, we have to find some way of doing this. It, you know, it, it's going to be crucial to get people to make that, to, to take those steps. If I may, there is one other sort of small point that I wanted to make about, which I think is also a different kind of partnership, which is about distribution um, uh, and particularly that last mile distribution, um, which in cities, I think we, we need to take on that challenge as well. And it's something we're keen on doing in Oxford and have already done to some extent. So we've got some really good local social enterprises, uh, including one called Pedal and Post, who deliver parcels for the last mile. And that's really important. I mean, I've been sitting at home here today and had two parcels arrive from two separate van deliveries uh, in the space of two minutes um and i'm just like, <laughs> and actually you know mo both of those could really have come uh, by bike um and 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 didn't um so i i would have um i think when we're talking about people's changing lifestyles post pandemic one of the things we do know is that people are ordering a lot more online so getting that distribution right is going to be really important. And that I do think uh, is where there will need to be public private partnerships because local councils will need to do some work in terms of trying to help set up those distribution centers uh, and encourage those measures to be taken. Um, but clearly we also need the companies to, to take some responsibility for, for getting involved and, and setting up the networks themselves. Yeah, no, I very much uh, agree with that. And again, not exclusively, but a an issue that particularly affects our urban areas because of the just because yeah. of the density and proximity of the you know of them, and therefore there is a lot of stuff moving around at any one time. So, rationalising that to the extent that we can, I think we would see some really good um, gains from that. Look, we could uh, we could go on. Uh, we have hardly skimmed the surface of the issue. Never mind what's in the um, the report, but it is uh, five twenty nine. So we need to um, to finish. Thank you. Uh, everybody for uh, being involved, my, I, in particular to my speakers, Neil, uh, to Susan, obviously Valentin, my colleague for uh, for the report and the presentation, and certainly to uh, to Ian. My thanks more broadly to HSBC UK, Ian, and your team for working with us on the research and on the event. It's very, very much uh, appreciated. A very, uh, very great partner to to be working with on this particular issue. Thank you all for coming and posting your.
um, questions. We didn't get through uh, half of them, but we got through some of them. So thank you very much for that. As I said at the beginning, um, you will get a recording uh, of the event. If you want to look back at it, you will see the slides and indeed you will have a link to the report all on our website, centerbitcities.org. Uh, a plug for our next event is on the 15th of July next week. And actually, it's the first in a four-part series that we are running, which is focusing on the kind of dilemmas and tensions uh, associated with the government's uh, levelling up agenda. And the first one is going to focus on some of the tensions and dilemmas uh, associated with the politics and the economics of levelling up. So if you're interested in that, and you don't think it's all plain sailing and we can do everything everywhere all at the same time, that event is a good one to come and uh, come and participate in and listen uh, to. So details on our, on our website. But until the next time, thank you all again. Thank you to my speakers. Thank you to HSBC. Uh, go well and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.